Okay, we are on Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. John the Baptist beheaded. When they cut off John the Baptist's head. At that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus. And he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That's why, that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodus, his brother Philip's wife. Herod was having sex with his brother's wife. Herodus. These people are proud, to say the least. See, this guy has a lot of power. His word, you know, whatever he says, he's rich, he's wealthy. He's probably a big fat cat down there. He desires his brother's wife, so he's sleeping with his brother's wife. Now, Herod had a, arrested John the Baptist and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodus, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, see, John the Baptist had no fear. He would say the truth. He, John the Baptist was telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. Yeah, that's what you want to hear. You're this big, huge guy of power. And this smelly guy coming out of the desert, John the Baptist. But never forget, God chose John the Baptist to prepare the way before his son, the King of Kings. So John the Baptist was going around and saying loudly, probably, you're not supposed to be sleeping with your brother's wife. It's against the laws of the Jews and against God's law. That would be embarrassing. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. Do you read that? The leaders are actually afraid of the people. That's true with our government now in the United States. What do they say? They're always talking about the radical right wing might rise up. The radical left wing might rise up. They're scared to death that the middle class people will stop working and stop making their payments on their houses. They seem like they got a lot of power in the government and every news story on the, you know, the news is about, the, you know, it's not about Jesus. You don't hear about Jesus on the news. You hear about the president, the vice president, the Congress, the Senate, the governors of the states. That's where all the news comes from. And then we get some crazy, stupid news from Hollywood. But the people in charge are actually afraid of the uh, masses. The people, they're scared to death of them. Most people don't understand that. Herod wanted to kill John because he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodus danced for the guest and pleased Herod so much. Now he's about to stick his foot in his mouth right here. Some little girl is dancing in front of him, and he wants to be a big shot and show his power and be the, he wants to be the, um, the big shot. He wants to be the savior of the party and wants everybody to love him. He's looking for his reward on this earth. He promised with an oath, on oath in front of all his guests, to give the girl whatever she asked for. Wow, that's pretty dangerous. 
telling a little kid, I'll give you anything you ask for. What if she would have said, okay, I want your entire kingdom and all your money, your horses, everything. Because he took an oath. See, he wanted to be liked so much by the, the crowds that he got up and made an oath. I am so pleased with this little girl's dancing. Be like if your 12-year-old daughter was, you know, in ballet class. And you said, I'll give you anything you want. Seems a little ridiculous to spoil a girl just for dancing around in circles about, around, around a bunch of drunken adults. Because you know they were all sitting there drunk at this party. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodus danced for the guest and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said. Okay, so the mother says, oh, come over here. This is, a, um, this is an opportunity to take advantage of Herod. This is an opportunity. I'm going to use my little girl's dancing to have Herod do something. So the little girl goes to Herod and says, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Oh, wow. See, Herod, Herod was a king. Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter right here in front of me. No little girl would ask for that. No. That came from her evil mother. This woman, she slept with her husband. She slept with his brother. Sounds like he had a, um, she had a child, maybe out of wedlock, who knows. They're all committing adultery with each other. They want to please each other, get drunk, drink the wine. I'm going out with the king, Herod. I can get anything I want. Just got to sleep with him. Just completely the opposite of what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. Or the complete opposite of the 1,000 years of reign of Christ on the earth. So this, this is the foolishness that Herod is using to rule his kingdom. His little part of the kingdom. Just complete foolishness. Give me John's... The Baptist head on a platter, says the little girl. The king Herod was distressed. But because of his oath and his dinner guests, see, he made an oath. That was the problem. Then the guests would have said, oh, this is a man you cannot count on. He makes oaths. The king makes oaths and doesn't keep them. He ordered that her request be granted and had John the ba beheaded in the prison. So he calls over some guards, you know, his personal guards. Hey, this is, go down and cut off um, John the Baptist's head. Put it on a platter and bring it up here. Of course, the guards, they're going to do whatever they want so they don't get their head cut off. I mean, they're going to do whatever the king tells them, I meant to say, so they don't get killed. You go against the king, he'll kill you. Your head will be the next head on the platter. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. You know, what kind of sick freaks... Now, I used to go hunting when I was younger, but what kind of sick freak has like a 12 or 15-year-old daughter and she sees a man's head chopped off and this little girl doesn't eat, it doesn't even bother her. She just proudly walks over to her mother and says, look, I got a head on a platter. Wow, that is like, about as far away from Jesus as you can get, a far away from God as you can get. That's about as spoiled of a lifestyle as you. You're carrying around a, a prophet's head, 
and you have no understanding of right or wrong. I'm setting the scene for you. This little girl, she was trained to please. You know, in three years, someone's going to look at her and say, hey, I like your daughter there. And they're going to make a treaty on something. You know, I'll open up these um, these plants or whatever over here in my, my country if you give me your daughter so I can marry her and start, you know, having sex with her. That's all the kind of life this girl was bred for. She was raised and bred for this, just like her mother. Her mother, if she, if her mother wanted to get ahead in life, she just committed adultery with the king. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Verse 13, Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. I think it was disturbing to him as a man in the flesh. I believe in the flesh, Jesus was greatly disturbed by what just happened. I mean, I would be, I'm disturbed by it now and I'm not even there. And I've seen animal heads cut off of the bodies. I worked in a packing house once. So if anybody would be used to it, it would be someone like me. And I grew up on a farm, but to have a man's head cut off so, you know, casually. And then prayed around a party and all the guests like, oh, look, it's a head of a prophet. These people, you wonder, and, and you out there, I want to talk to some of you out there that say, well, every everybody has a chance to be saved. Well, you're technically, you're right about that. Even God says that. But that doesn't mean they're going to be saved. And I know Christians who chase people to the ends of the earth, chasing people that are going to hell you will chase them their entire life, hoping to save them, maybe your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, and they are going to hell because they're never going to change. And what are you really doing? You're really saying you just want to feel better about yourself. 70% of the world is going to hell today in our modern times. Only 2 billion people will be saved. According to how many people profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It might actually only be one billion. And then what do you have? You have 85% of the world's population today is going to go to hell. Jesus told the, um, we'll get into this either in this gospel or one of the others. He said to the Pharisees, you will go to the ends of the earth thinking, trying to save one soul, convert one soul. He was talking about how wrong it was. And, you know, they'll go to the ends of the earth to convert someone over to their, it reminds me of Jehovah Witnesses. You know, there's only 12,000 or 12 million Jehovah Witnesses worldwide. And they are going to the ends of the earth to find more Jehovah Witnesses. They've been around for over 100 years, like 125 years. So if you were going to convert people, you think you'd have a lot more than 12 million believers in 125 years. Well, that's God saying he's closing the door in the face of the Jehovah Witness. He's closing the door because they don't follow his son. They try to follow God directly, and then they go to the ends of the earth. And then people like um, King Herod, he's trying to get converts. At the same time, he's cutting off you know, the prophet John the Baptist's head. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. I think he wanted to be alone and pray. 
I think he said, I want to pray. I think he was speaking to his father. Father, as a man in the flesh. Father, they just cut off um, your servant, John the Baptist's head, as you know. I think it disturbed him. You know, of course, he was a man with feelings, and he did not like that. He probably had to withdraw to a private place so he didn't go down there, you know, and send, you know, burning sulfur right on top of Herod's head, you know. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So check this out. All the crowds, you see, that's you and I and how inconsiderate we are. Unconsiderate. We are the most vile generation in the history of the world. They just cut off John the Baptist's head. But the crowds, they don't give Jesus five minutes. They're following him around saying, hey, 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 what about me? What about me? I need something. I need something. Most people don't catch that. But what did Jesus do? He doesn't hold it against them. He takes compassion on them. What would you do if someone kept hounding you at your house? They kept coming to your house, not stop hounding you. And you just wanted to be left alone and live a Christian life. But but they, and okay, I'm making a point here. And they just keep hounding you at your own private place, you know. That's like, you, this is your private place where you come home to have privacy and pray and think. But are you like one of those people, the people that say, hey, what about me? I want something from you. I want something from you. Well, now imagine Jesus and there's 5,000 people hounding him. Could you imagine 5,000 people coming to your house, always wanting something from you? You may say it sounds good. No, you're, you're full. Those people would tear you to pieces until you are completely exhausted and dead in a hospital. People don't respect each other's space anymore. Now look, but what was Jesus's response? Jesus had compassion on them and healed their sick. Why? Because he saw them as people without understanding. They don't even understand that John the Baptist's head was cut off. They just want what they want. It sounds cruel, but if you think about it, that's what they're doing. So he's having compassion. Now, you know, it doesn't say these people were believers. He healed all the sick from the believers. No, it doesn't say that. Do you think all of those 5,000 or whatever following him were believers? Probably not. You think all the people listening on the Sermon on the Mount were believers? No, they weren't. If you allow this world and people to keep chasing you because you think you're going to be able to help them or do some good for them, or there's only one result every time I found in 61 years. They're not there to help you or give you space. They are there to get something from you even if that's just them patting themselves on the back or whatever. Very few people today give something without wanting something in return. And I'm not saying I don't trust people. That's not what I'm saying. Look at these people with Jesus. So why do you think, if this is how they treated Jesus, why do you think we treat each other differently? This is how they treated Jesus, but I would never do that to my neighbor. No, that's not true. It actually says in the Bible, stay at your own house and do not be found at your neighbor's house. Do not be found often over at your neighbor's house. Go to your own house at night, lock the door and teach your wife and children about the Lord and Jesus Christ and the Holy Word, the Bible. 
The Bible says absolutely nothing about going over to your neighbor's house all the time. In fact, the Bible tells you not to do it. And he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus, see, these people, they weren't even smart enough to take food with them. They just want, you know, another um, time Jesus says, I in another gospel, he says, I tell you the truth, you did not follow me because... You wanted me. You followed me because I gave you free food. He said fish and loaves before. That's why you're following me again. He's telling them right to their face, you're following me because you got a free meal last time. Give a man a free meal and he will stop working and he will he will chase you and he will let you pay for everything he needs the rest of his life. That is why it is a crazy business today that the modern day church is in the business of feeding and housing the homeless people who are drug addicted, on alcohol. They go to the church to get the free stuff. They do not go to the church because they believe in Jesus Christ. They go to the church to get the free food. But the modern day church doesn't really understand that. Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. That's funny. He told his disciples, why don't you feed them? He said, why don't you feed them, give them something to eat? So he may have been testing their faith, but he's saying, I think in a way he's saying, why do you keep, you know, like he told his mother, why are you involving me, woman? When, it, when he, she said, turn the water into wine, he said, why are you involving me? You see, as a man in the flesh, Jesus felt exhaustion. But it doesn't matter as long as you get what you want from Jesus. And then you run away. And you don't give anything back. There's a lot of people this time of year who give gifts. They're not really giving gifts for, like, you sit down at Christmas. You're not really giving gifts because you want your brother or your sister to have, you know, a new pair of socks. You're giving gifts to save fate so you look good in front of the family. But you put no thought into it whatsoever. You just like, give your brother of 40 years a pair of socks. You know, I picture all these people just staring at Jesus. We're kind of hungry. What time's lunch? Uh, like Jesus is just going to whip 5,000 um, pieces of bread out of his pocket. But that's what he did, ended up doing then. But what did Jesus do? He took compassion on them. Then he said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. His disciples said, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks... And broke the loaves. Now, I want to um, make a point here. He gave thanks. Jesus gave thanks. Jesus did not say, Lord, can you, Father, my Father in heaven, can you feed these people for me? He did not go into a big prayer. 
He gave thanks automatically for what they were about to receive. He gave thanks. What are we about to receive? When you pray, that's why I tell you, when you're praying, say, Lord, what is it you want me to have? You really should never be going to God saying, Lord, this is what I'm I'm asking for. I haven't received it yet. Lord, this is what I want. No, no. You got it all backwards. You should say, Lord, Father, what is it you want me to have? And that's what I'll pray for and give thanks for. He broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. That's funny because there were 12 disciples, so each disciple had to carry a basketful away. The number of those who ate was about 5,000. That's how I knew there were 5,000 people there. Men besides women and children. So there were more than 5,000. It was just 5,000 men plus whatever women and children were there. So there could have been up to 15,000 people or 20,000. My point is, you're not, even at church as a Christian, you're supposed to be involved in Christianity together, but you're not supposed to be involved in someone else's life to the point. You just keep trying to take something from them and exhaust them. Now, I want to say about Jesus, in this particular instance, he took um, mercy on them. It said, it said he took compassion on them. So this is one point where most people get confused about God. So if he's taking compassion on them now, let's fast forward to the end of the tribulation judgment day. How come God isn't taking compassion on the people, the non-believers on Judgment Day? I've been asked that question quite a bit. It's a very typical question. And the, the quick answer is because God's mercy and compassion has limits. You say, what? Now, I never said his love has limits. No, I never said that. His mercy and compassion, he will one day look away. One day he's going to look away and say, it's over. There's no more chance to be saved. My offer through Jesus Christ is over. It has a time limit. And I'm not trying to make a joke, but remember the old Kmart blue light specials. For the next 10 minutes, we have a blue light special, you know, in whatever, men's underwear or whatever. And everybody tried to run over there and get the special. God is the same way. God says, it's been 2,030 years. Then there's going to be the um, seven-year tribulation. And at that moment, my offer of mercy is over. It expires with the non-believers. Or, actually, when you die... I've been asked this question. When you die, how come God isn't, doesn't show that same mercy and compassion and say, well, you never did believe in my son, but I'm going to go ahead and save you anyway because I have unlimited mercy and compassion. See, people don't know God because God is so holy. That's the answer. His holiness cannot allow you to walk all over him. You cannot live a life of sin, reject his son, reject God's offer, 
and then turn around and expect the same prize as the believer gets for doing all the work for Christ. No, there will be no prize for you. God's compassion and mercy has an ending. God's timeline. And the devil is working overtime today to make you believe the rapture is not going to come. Jesus walks on the water. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd. So he told them, you get in. Start Start pedaling, paddling, start rowing, or get the sail up, start going to the other side of the lake. I'll meet you over there. And it was just Jesus and the 5,000, and he's saying, well, I'd like to know what he told that crowd, actually. But he's, it just says he's dismissing them. But he was saying, there were many things Jesus said that are not recorded. That is very clear in the Bible. It said, these are recorded, the stories we have, so that you may believe and so be saved, it says. But Jesus um, performed many miracles that were never once recorded. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Wow. So he went all the way up to the mountain to pray for like three hours. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. Imagine here on the Oregon coast, the boat goes out 20 miles and then Jesus just starts walking on the water. I don't think he walked all the way. I think he made himself appear near the boat and started walking towards them. In my personal opinion, I don't have any proof of that. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land. Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So they were having trouble rowing the boat or sailing or whatever. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Shortly before dawn. So, you know, if sun comes up at 7 o'clock, this was like 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. He's walking towards them in the dark of the night. On the water, towards the boat. Jesus is walking on the water, probably the number one most famous miracle in the entire Bible. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. I wonder how many people have read that the first couple times, never put it together. Jesus is walking on water, man. They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. So they immediately slipped back into their worldly ways. Because their brain, they have been taught since they have been taught since birth that only a ghost could float along the water like that. So for those of you who say, do you believe in ghosts? Would you know that they the disciples are yelling it's a ghost? Like a spirit? People say they don't believe in ghosts or spirits today, but the disciples 2,030 years ago were well trained that ghosts and spirits exist. They yelled, it's a ghost. And it wasn't a friendly ghost. It wasn't Casper the ghost. It was a, a real, e they, they only associated ghosts with evil. It, it is a, it's a ghost they said, and cried out in fear. Most people miss that. 
They're yelling and screaming like a Rottweiler's chasing them. Hey, it's a goose. They're like, ah, 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 help us, help us. These men, the disciples on the boat, are in complete, total fear. They're seeing a ghost coming towards them. This ghost is going to harm them. They're crying out and screaming in fear for their lives. Most people miss that. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage! Explanation point. It is I. Don't be afraid. They were so afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, he didn't believe it. He thought it was a ghost saying, it's me, Jesus. He still believed it was a ghost saying, it's me, Jesus. And the only way Peter was going to believe that that was Jesus, if Jesus performed a miracle and let him walk on the water with him. And that worked for a few seconds until he started to sink, sink in his faith. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Come on, come on, Peter, walk. Step out of the boat. Now, how many of us would have courage to do that? Not me. I would have no courage to do that. Step out of the boat, onto the water, and think I, like I'm stepping on land or a dock and I can just walk in the water? So you got to give Peter credit here. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Peter's the only other man to walk on water. He gets down out of the boat, and starts walking towards Jesus on the water. But Peter, he's a fisherman, so he's probably a great swimmer. He's probably thinking, hey, the most that'll happen, I'll get wet here and sink down and I'll just swim up again. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink cried out, Lord, save me. So his lack of faith. So like when you're in a situation and your lack of faith starts to take over and you start feeling yourself sinking in life. Or if your wife came home, I hope this never happens to you, but if she comes home and says, I'm leaving you for another man and your heart sinks. I'm just giving you uh, an example of how Peter must have felt when he started sinking. He was full of fear. He was scared. He was like a child crying out to his mother. Save me, Lord. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. But when he, Peter, saw the wind, he was afraid, see, and began to sink. Okay, and when the wind climbed, or when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. They're realizing now, only the Son of God or God himself or an angel or what could start walking across water. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touched the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it, his cloak, were healed. See, I want to mention two things here. Number one is the people. He crosses the lake, and a whole bunch of people from that side of the lake start chasing him. They're not asking, do you ever hear anybody say to Jesus, 
Lord, I'm sick, but what do you want me to do in life? I would like to be healed, Lord, but it's more important that I do what you want me to do. I take Paul the, Ap Paul the Apostle as a perfect example. It said he had a physical thorn of some kind of pain in his life. He asked Jesus to take it away, and Jesus said, No, my, um, my strength is enough for you. So Paul had to live with that. But it was more important that he serves Jesus instead of being healed. The second thing I wanted to bring up was Jesus, as God, has the ability to walk on the water, shape shift into different shapes, and he has the ability to control time. Now, I'm getting very technical, but when it said, and Jesus immediately grabbed Peter's hand and pulled him up. Most people don't get this, so listen. What just happened? See, because Jesus was several feet or several yards away from Peter. Because Peter was still walking towards Jesus. So Jesus had stopped and said, Peter, come to me. So I'm thinking about halfway across, he began to see the wind and had little faith and he began to sink. Now listen very closely to what it says. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. How is that possible? If Jesus was like 10 yards away, 30 foot away. Now, I could be wrong. Um, Jesus could have been standing right there next to him. I don't think so. The way it reads, how did Jesus, how did Jesus immediately move forward in his flesh, like 30 foot forward immediately? How, how did he do that? How did he just, in one second, move 30 foot forward? Now, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. That's fine. It's not a salvation issue. It's not a life or death issue, heaven or hell. It's just a thought I had when I read that. How did Jesus immediately move like 50 foot in one second? Because Peter started sinking, and Jesus immediately, it says, if they took, if they said, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him after he splashed around for a while. No, it doesn't say that. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Well, I'm just making a point. How, how did Jesus, how did Jesus move forward that fast? You see, you would have had to control time. You would have to control time by an instant of a thought. Now, of course, God created all the heavens and the earth in six days. I want you to picture you're walking towards your, your family across the parking lot and you're like 100 foot away, like 30 yards away. And you see your child's about to fall and you can just think about it and you're immediately next to your child catching them. That's some kind of superhero ability. That's the only way I know how to put it. And the reason I'm telling you this is because that's who you're serving as a God. And I cannot wait to get to heaven at the rapture. We're going to be raptured and we're going to see every ability God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit actually has. 
And so he, I mean, just think about it. That means Jesus. Now, I already know all this. I'm just telling you. I'm not trying to figure this out. I've figured this out long, many, 30 years ago. That God can say to himself, I want to be on the planet Saturn, and he's standing there. In one second. And why do the nations conspire and rage against the Lord, says the book of Proverbs. Why do the nations rage and conspire against the Lord? Why are we trying, why are we trying to put astronauts on the moon again? How stupid are we? Should we be trying to figure out the surface of the moon and its minerals? Or should we be trying to figure out the one who made the moon and its minerals? But it's never going to happen. Only about 20% of the earth is going to follow Jesus and be saved, and 80% is not going to do it. They are going to invent war planes and shoot each other because they're going to invent coronaviruses to kill each other. I mean, if you think that was um, an accident, well, you got a lot more um, faith than I do if you think that was an accident. I think they were trying to get rid of 100 million people on the earth myself. And I think they were trying to use that, the enemy, the devil, to completely control everybody on the earth automatically three and a half years ago when they started it. God has the ability. You know, we had we sent a probe like 17 years ago. And it's been trying to go to the end of our, our galaxy, just our galaxy. And there's unlimited number of galaxies beyond our galaxy. And do you want to know what? We sent that probe and it got to the end of our galaxy. You can look it up. It was about um, three years ago, two years ago. It said it went past anything we know, planets and all that, and it went into like this curtain-type darkness, and it kept going, and we were still receiving signals from it, and then the news media stopped talking about it. And um, NASA, they stopped talking about it. They said um, nothing about it, nothing. They said, ah, hey, let's talk about going to the moon again. Now, either they lost contact with that probe or they got photos of um, something beyond our galaxy that they can't even talk about or explain. When you look up just the planets that we know about, there's one planet, one planet that if you were to go um, like a thousand miles an hour, it would take four years to go around, go around the planet one time. So should we be trying to um, make, you know, if we were making um, rocket ships and rockets to blow each other up and all this stuff, we could have solved every human need on the earth the way God wanted us to do it. God wanted us to take compassion on each other, love each other, and he would have gave us the rest. You know that in during the 40 years, I'll tell you something more profound, in case you haven't ever heard this, you can read the Old Testament. During the 40 years the Israelites walked in the desert, it says their clothing or their shoes never wore out. They had the same clothes and shoes for 40 years, and God made them never wear out on purpose to show his power. They walked in those shoes for 40 years, and they were the same exact shoes as when they started day one. What does God want to give you? Well, I tell you, he doesn't want to give you something that's at your neighbor's house. 
and he doesn't want to give you a brand new car for forty, fifty thousand. He doesn't want to give you um, a, a sauna or a jacuzzi so you can sit around and be more lazy. And he doesn't want to give you things that will give you more comfort, make you more comfortable. Because, you know, uh, we all know Americans are not spoiled enough yet, so we need more comfort. God doesn't want you to buy a um, $900, you know, leather chair to sit in in front of a TV. That is not God. That is the enemy satisfying every one of your daily needs to take you away from God and make your faith weaker. I'm going to end with this. Think of your faith as a muscle, either a muscle in your arm or in your leg. The devil wants to weaken that muscle to the point where you can't even use your arm the devil wants to weaken your muscle to the point to where your faith to where the point where you can't even um, use your Christianity anymore. You might be saved and you will be going to heaven, but you'll be 100% ineffective, ineffective, no effect. You'll have no positive effect for Christ on this earth. But God, he wants to take that muscle and make your arms and legs stronger, meaning he wants to take your faith and make it stronger and stronger and stronger. So the older you get, the more fruit you produce for the kingdom of God. And remember, God is looking to take the smallest, dumbest, most insignificant things on this earth and use them to glorify his name. Then that way nobody can say that they did it. They would have to admit, like myself, I could have never done this. Anybody who really knows me knows Dave could have never done any of these things on his own. I would have failed. They were all done by Jesus and given to me for free by Jesus. You see, he takes the wise things of this world and makes them look foolish. And he takes the, the small, naive things of this earth and he raises them up to glorify his name, to make the wise people look even dumber. Because the wise people say, I don't need God. I can do this on my own. But the, the small shepherd boy named King David, he's like, yeah, I'll take anything you got because I don't have anything. <laughs>